Good evening and welcome to a special edition of the Road to City Hall. I'm Dominic Carter. Tonight, our entire program is dedicated to the first Democratic debate of the public advocates race. This debate is sanctioned by the city's campaign finance board, an independent nonpartisan agency, which does the following. Administers the campaign finance program, publishes the New York City Voter Guide, and also administers debates. The board gives public matching funds to candidates for city office who limit contributions and spending and agree to full disclosure of their finances. Citywide candidates who are able to establish a minimum level of public support must participate in debates, which are sponsored by media outlets selected by the board. Tonight's debate is being sponsored by New York One, New York One Noticias, New York City Newsday, and WNYC Radio. In addition to being aired live in English on New York One and in Spanish on New York One Noticias, tonight's debate will also be broadcast in Mandarin on New Tang Dynasty Television. The second public advocate debate will be held on Sunday, August 28th at 6 a.m. on Channel 4. All debates will be carried live on WNYC AM 820. Now for the candidates. We are joined by Norman Siegel, Betsy Gottbaum, Andrew Rache, and Jay Ghalib. We begin with opening one-minute statements from the candidates. The order was randomly determined earlier today, and we start tonight with Norman Siegel. Good evening, Dominic. My fellow New Yorkers, my dream is to achieve freedom, justice, and equality for all of us not just some of us. The Office of the Public Advocate has enormous potential. The Constitution speaks of our government for and by the people. The Public Advocate's Office should be the vehicle to ensure oversight and accountability over the city government. I would decentralize this office, re-energize it, put satellite offices in all five boroughs. I would, again, have town hall meetings in all communities. I would recruit and train hundreds of volunteers to be volunteer public advocates. They would go to senior centers, they'd go to housing projects, and they would listen and address New Yorkers' concerns. When 9-11 family members needed someone to go and fight to get the 9-11 tapes and transcripts, I became their advocate. When people in Williamsburg and East Harlem fought with regard to the closing of their firehouses, I became their advocate. Okay, Mr. Siegel. I'm a private advocate. Help me become your next public advocate. Thank you very much, Mr. Siegel. And now, Betsy Gottbaum. Good evening. My name is Betsy Gottbaum, and I am your public advocate. Thank you to those who supported me in 2001, and to those of you who have supported me for the past four years. I'm proud of the work I've done over the past four years. I've helped hundreds of New Yorkers and chil children and seniors with government-related problems. And I get results. That's because I understand what the Public Advocate's Office is about. I have the experience and the know-how to make city government work for New Yorkers. I make sure that homebound seniors like Nettie and Jack Gutlinski get their hot meals daily. Parents like Phil Ke Kelly get his children the services they need. The families live in decent housing and that those who are eligible get the food stamps. And when there was a need to replace an ambulances after 911, I went out, I raised the money, and I purchased those ambulances. Okay. And I'm okay. also a check on the mayor and I proved that by constantly talking against the West Side Stadium. Thank you, Ms. Scott Baum. And now we turn to Mr. Andrew Rache. Thank you, Dominic. My name's Andrew Rache. Eight years ago, I walked into a public school in my neighborhood, Washington Irving High School, and I saw kids typing on electric typewriters. There wasn't a single computer in the school. I sent an email to 10 of my friends asking them if they would help me build a computer lab and connect it to the internet. 200 people showed up. Their energy inspired me to start a nonprofit organization called Mouse, which today trains students to maintain and build computer networks in their schools. We're operating in 100 schools in New York in five boroughs, serving 90,000 students and 6,000 teachers. 
Best of all, 90% of the kids in our program graduate and go to college. When I walk around our city today, I feel the same way I did when I walked into that school and saw kids typing on typewriters while the internet was exploding around them. I feel that our city is disconnected from the opportunities of the 21st century and there isn't a single politician who can help us get there. That's why part of my plan is to provide low-cost wireless internet access for all of New Yorkers. That's what you'll get from me as public advocate, ideas as big as New York. Thank you very much, Mr. Rache, and now Mr. Golub. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Jay Golub. Uh, I'd like to first thank the New York One for the opportunity to debate tonight. This is great to have an opportunity in a forum to talk about reform issues, new issues, and this is the perfect office to do it. Um, I grew up on Long Island from a middle class family. Uh, I went to NYU to go to dental school in 1990, uh, opened up a practice in Sunnyside, working class Queens, and have been there ever since. Uh, many of my patients are cops, teachers, firemen, construction workers, uh, and the truth is I've learned a lot from them over the years. I've listened to them. I know what their problems are, and part of the reason why I'm running here and why I'm here tonight is to try to do something about the problems that they face. Um, you're going to hear some new stuff from me tonight, reform ideas, different ideas, stuff you don't normally hear. I'd like you to listen to me. Listen to the ideas. Don't listen to the other nonsense that's going to go on sometimes in some of these debates. This is new stuff. This is different stuff. And I think the mass of all of you out there are going to be interested. And if you like what you heard from me tonight, please vote for me uh, on Election Day. Thank you very much, Mr. Gollop. And now we have a round of questions for the candidates. My question will be directed towards a specific candidate who will have a minute to respond. The other candidates will then also have one minute rebuttals. The first candidate to complete the process will be allotted 30 additional seconds for a response. And the first question tonight is for Mr. Siegel. Mr. Siegel, in a campaign ad, you featured families of 9-11 victims who praised you while criticizing government officials, including the incumbent public advocate Betsy Gottbaum, for not doing enough in assisting them. What should have Betsy Gottbaum done in dealing with those families that she didn't do? And is it really appropriate for you to use victim families in a campaign ad? It's appropriate to talk about 9-11. Ms. Gottbaum said it was negative and tacky. It's not negative. Perhaps it was critical. But that's what a democracy is about, raising critical questions about the government, what they did right, what they didn't do right. Second, she said it was tacky. Anyone who watches that ad sees the eloquence of the family members. They came to me. They wanted to make the commercial. I'm not in the commercial. Missed opportunities. Right after 9-11, the public advocate should have been their advocate with regard to the claims that they were making. Second, I would have had a 9-11 New York City Commission that would have looked at why the radios failed, why the radios are still not working today, why the command between the police and the firefighters was not working, why it's still not working today. I would also look at the issue with regard to how the World Trade Center was built years ago and whether or not we're going to, when we build it today, is it going to comply with fire and building codes? There's so much that the public advocate should have done. She did not do it, and she missed this opportunity. Ms. Scott Baum? Well, I believe that after 9-11, what I did was not something to boast about. I was very proud to be a New Yorker, and I believe that all New Yorkers did what they could to be helpful. As I mentioned earlier in my opening statement, when ambulances were destroyed, I went out, I raised the money, and I replaced those ambulances. In addition, I helped the Port Authority police get health insurance and health coverage. I also helped men and women who worked in, in the World Trade Center who had no place to go to, to use an office. And I spent as much time as I possibly could assisting the Windows on the World workers to set up a co-op restaurant. I do think it's inappropriate to use for political reasons something that was so tragic and that all of us feel so terribly about, and I totally disagree with my opponent. Thank you very much, Mr. Rache. Well, if you remember, Dominic, there were many communication problems on September 11th. Not only did the radios not work, but our cell phones didn't work, and we didn't even use the emergency broadcast network on that day. So I'm very concerned about making sure that we have a robust communication network because, frankly, that's our best defense if there's going to be another serious incident like September 11th. But on September 11th, I did something a little different than our existing public advocate. I reached out to the New Yorkers who wanted to help. I organized hundreds of New Yorkers to go downtown and help small businesses get back up and running and to get the schools that were displaced back up and running as well. 
And not only did I take that idea and help down in, on lo in Lower Manhattan, I went to Washington, where I proposed a bill to the U.S. Senate for the creation of a national tech corps, literally a national guard of technology people who could help rebuild communication networks in the event of any kind of emergency. That bill passed the Senate 97 to 0 and is now part of the Homeland Security Act. It's that kind of leadership that we need to bring to the Public Advocate's Office. Thank you very much, Mr. Dalloub. Um, Norm deserves tremendous credit for what, what he did with the families of 9-11, and uh, I don't think that ad was in bad taste in any way, shape, or form. Truth is, Ms. Gottbaum should have used her role as public advocate to fight against the federal and state government to get more resources. Instead of issuing press releases, get out, organize people, and do something about it. And I think the Public Advocate's Office is meant for that, um, and I think she failed in that job. Now, a response from Mr. Siegel. Uh, the 9-11 families needed someone in government to represent them and be their advocate. They needed someone to fight when the Bloomberg administration denied their request for historical documents so they could reconstruct what happened that morning. They needed someone to go and get the ashes of their loved ones moved out of the garbage dump in Fresh Kills. The Public Advocate's Office seemed to not include the 9-11 families' needs in their public position. I think that's wrong, and if I'm the public advocate, I will be the advocate for 9-11 family members and other people who have similar needs. My next question now is for Betsy Gottbaum, the public advocate. Some of your critics, as you know, say there is no real need for the office of the public advocate to exist. What have you accomplished in the last three and a half years that would point to that you would point to to silence those critics? Well, first of all, Dominic, I believe that what I've accomplished is great in the last four years. First of all, New Yorkers turn to us when they have no place else to turn. They call 311 for, reference, for, for a referral. When they call our office, we have highly trained, highly skilled workers who actually help them through their problems. So people call us with all kinds of problems, starting with problems with excess ride, to meals on wheels, to domestic violence problems, to problems where they don't know what else to do or where else to turn. And we spend enormous amount of time helping New Yorkers solve those problems. I believe that's an essential service for the city of New York. I also have oversight over the very powerful mayor. And I do take the mayor on when I have to. Thank you. Response now from Mr. Rache. Well, I believe that this office has an incredible amount of potential. It's only limited by the imagination of its office holder. But while Ms. Ms. Gottbaum was busy releasing uh, press releases and making and holding press conferences, I demonstrated in four months in my campaign more potential for this office than she has in four years. I'll give you an example. If you go to my website, Rache.com, or to wefixnyc.com, you'll see a site where people in New York can take pictures of potholes with their cell phone cameras or broken tree limbs over parks or any other problem that New York City and its citizens might see with their own eyes and take a picture of it and send it into the city so it can be fixed right away. We have tens of thousands of public advocates in New York. New York's most underutilized resource is its own people. And the public advocate's office can be completely re reinvented by by harnessing the energy of all New Yorkers who care about their cities and are already working in their neighborhoods to make our cities safer. Thank you, Mr. Gallo. People are talking about this because she's not really doing a good job. And uh, just seeing the role of public advocate as ombudsman is not what the role of this job is. The city charter outlines what the powers of the public advocate are, and they are a lot stronger than just being ombudsman. So uh, as soon as there's maybe a change in who the public advocate is, I think we'll hear the clamor for ending the office disappear. Mr. Siegel. Uh, is an office great when a majority of New Yorkers don't even know who the public advocate is? Is an office great when a majority of the people in New York don't even know what the public advocate does? Uh, when it refuses to engage in debates with her opponents and says that the rationale is that it might be boring for the voters to hear debates, uh, it's undermining democracy. But isn't she here tonight? <laughs> She's in this debate. But we wanted debates more than just New York 1 and Channel 4. We want it in the neighborhoods around the city. An incumbent should be out there speaking to the opponents. And when that doesn't happen, I mean, debates are exciting. They're inspiring. They're not boring. The people here, her opponents, speak well. They have a vision. They're independent. 
And that should have been the dialogue. When that doesn't happen, you can't say that the Public Advocate's Office is great. And when you make that statement, I wonder uh, what's really going on there, or is that just a defensive uh, response? Now, a response from Ms. Gopam. Well, starting in April of this year, I went all over the city in forums and debates with, certainly with Mr. Siegel, uh, when we started the process of campaigning against each other. And I went to all five boroughs and did a lot of forums and a lot of debates. And the Campaign Finance Board, which sanctions and gives the conditions under which we should be debating are exactly what I'm adhering to. I'm here tonight and I plan to be here Sunday and I hope you'll all be here too. Now we turn to Mr. Rache. Your pet issue on the campaign trail, creating a citywide wireless internet network. But for argument's sake here, let's just say perhaps it's a great idea Let's just give you that, just for argument's sake. But what does that really have to do with the job of public advocate? And how would the city possibly pay for this? And would this, for example, be fair to millions of New Yorkers who can't even afford to buy computers? No, I, I see that one of the biggest challenges facing New York is that our leaders don't understand that there's a technology revolution happening all around us. And as a result, New York is missing out on all kinds of opportunities to strengthen its economy, improve our schools, and give New Yorkers a greater say in their city government. And worse, New York City is falling behind. 95% of all the jobs in the future are going to require computer skills, according to the Department of Commerce. So where my opponents see a tangle of web, wires, and computers, I see amazing new tools that can be used to help make New York stronger and better. Firefighters would be able to download burning p blueprints of burning buildings on the way to a fire. Who's going to pay for it? Well, you know, it's only going to cost about $80 million. That's about a quarter of what it was going to cost to build the stadium. Only $80 million? Only $80 million. And what about the budget gap that's projected for next year? The, the economic benefits of this plan are so great, it will pay for itself within two or three years. $80 million is a small price to pay to save New Yorkers the $400 million that they're currently overpaying Verizon, Time Warner, and Cablevision for wireless services. Thank you very much. Mr. Gallup? Th this is just an intrusion of the private sector and the public sector mixing the wrong things together. Um, the truth is it is a waste of money to spend $80 million or whatever the cost would end up being on this project when the private world should be really dealing with this. Truth is there's a Starbucks across the street that you could go in, plug your computer in and get online. Um, today I had a patient in the office and his exact words when he brought up, the, brought up this issue with him was, I live in too small a house, I got two kids, I work real hard and I'd rather see a raise before I'd see everybody get free uh, online and Wi-Fi. Mr. Siegel. Uh, we must harness technology. That's the future. We can't ignore what's going on and what's going on in other cities around the country. The current public advocate office doesn't seem to be addressing these issues. I'm concerned about the need for technology in buildings, but also in the subway. I saw what happened in London. I'm concerned with regard to safety and security for New Yorkers. We need to address these issues. Public Advocate's Office is the quintessential place to discuss new ideas, to see where the future is going, not to sit back, not to be reactive, but to be proactive. And that's what I think has to happen. There should be hearings. People should testify. We can get new ideas with regard to what we should do with technology in the future. This is a legitimate issue, and the Public Advocate's Office has not been uh, doing the job on this issue. Ms. Gottbaum? Well, it is a, certainly a legitimate issue and it's a good idea. The problem is this is not what the public advocate does. In fact, the, the uh, official who, sh who would and, and could do this is the mayor. And I believe that the mayor uh, probably thinks that it should be a combination of public-private partnerships. I don't know. But I want to say that it seems to me in the Office of the Public Advocate, which is the ombuds, woman for the city of New York. A woman who is waiting for her permanent housing is not going to wait to, to have her house wired in order to get that housing. And to me it seems that while this is a good idea, it's not the place of the public advocate to set up that system. We have a three million dollar budget. How in the world are you going to make up the difference from this, with the eighty million dollar cost? And a final response on this question from Mr. Rache. Betsy, when the mayor fails to show leadership, it's exactly the public advocate's role to show leadership. And New York City is falling behind 21st century, 20, its 21st century opportunities. And Jay, frankly, I can't think of anything more important than saving working class and poor New Yorkers $500 a year 
is, which is what it's costing them now to connect to the Internet. Mm -hmm. Are you going to tell kids in public schools who can't connect to the Internet for more than an hour a week that they should go to Starbucks? Yeah, but the same patient told me he can't afford to buy a computer, so what's the point? The, the future is now, Jay. Wake up. Okay. Now we turn to Mr. Golub. Uh, currently, you run a family uh, dentist uh, business in, in Queens, and you have no governmental experience. What makes you think that you are the most qualified among your rivals to be second in line to the mayor? Because of my well-rounded ability to talk about a lot of issues. And the other part is this. Why do we have this vision that in the end the only people that can serve in government are people who have served in government? That basically means all incumbents should just win and we should just all let them just keep winning and term limits come and then their chief of staff should take over. In the end, what we need is people serving. This government, this country, this city, this state was all founded on people serving. Serving and going home. What I want to do is serve as public advocate, fight for the people of New York City aggressively, and when I'm done, I will go home and go back to business. That's the way people should serve and that's the way government should be. Mr. Siegel? Uh, elections should be decided on the merits. It should be based on who has the best ideas, who has the passion, who has the compassion, who has a record of accomplishment, who's independent, who will stand up to the powers be. Uh, the fact that uh, three opponents here don't have uh, government experience should be a factor, but not the exclusive factor. And I think if you go down that road, uh, as Jay was saying, you'll narrow the field for people in electoral politics. As far as I'm concerned, we got to kick the doors open, open the window, fresh air come in. When you see the incumbents getting elected again and again, that undermines the spirit of what democracy should be all about. Ms. Gottbaum. Well, I believe that my experience of 30 years in and out of government, of running a, a major agency in the city, and of, an, of a large cultural institution, and four years as public advocate, I believe that experience gives me the breadth and depth to succeed the mayor if, heaven forbid, anything should happen to the mayor. And I believe you do need to have that depth of experience and you do have to have the kind of uh, knowledge about government and how it works and how it doesn't work in order to succeed the mayor. Mr. Rache? Well, you know, nobody complained about Mike Bloomberg having no mm. government experience when he was elected oh. mayor some four years did. ago. Some people did. Maybe mm. some people did. But the, the reason why I think that this, uh, this conversation doesn't really think about the future is that we're not harnessing the power of all of New York's people to solve our problems. There are more people in the city who know how to solve problems than all the elected officials combined. And we're not harnessing their our ideas, we're not amplifying their voices, and we're not using their energy to make our city better. And now a, a final response on this question from Mr. Ballard. Well, I guess in the end my record of accomplishment is I'm a small business owner, I'm a taxpayer, I have a hus I'm a husband, I have a family, and in the end, you know, truth is, uh, Ms. Gottbaum, the 30 years of experience is part of the problem. We get status quo, same stuff, year in, year out. It's time for new things, change. This is the office to do that with because this is the office where change can be brought up and the people, like Andrew's been saying all night tonight, can rally around new ideas and make a difference and make a change. Thank you, Jay. Now we turn to the next round of our debate where the candidates get to ask each other questions. That candidate will have 60 seconds to respond. There will be very little rebuttals. We have two rounds of this type of questioning. Mr. Siegel, we begin with you. Who will you direct your first question to? Ms. Gottbaum. Uh, Ms. Gottbaum, in April of 2005, you stated that you, quote, have been very clear that you will not support development projects based on the use of eminent domain for private use. However, in June of 2005, you called the proposed Atlantic Yards project in downtown Brooklyn, quote, a wonderful, wonderful example of what development should be all about, despite the fact that it is based on the use of eminent domain for private development. How do you explain this contradiction? Was it your relationship with the developer? Shouldn't New Yorkers know where the public advocate stands on such a crucial issue as whether eminent domain can be used to take their homes and businesses away? <clears throat> oh, Mr. Siegel, let me point out to you that I am against the use of eminent domain. And it is not, I have not, it's not my understanding that the developer at the Atlantic Yards is going to use eminent domain. Uh, I have been told, in fact, that that is not the case. 
So if you know something different, that's something I don't know. But I'm against the use of eminent domain in the northern part of Manhattan and at the Atlantic Yards. I am concerned about the project in Atlantic Yards. I'm concerned about the size, and I'm concerned about the traffic, and I am also concerned if there is to be a use of eminent domain. But I have been told that there is not. Ms. Gottbaum, who would you like to put your question to? Um, I'll put my question to Mr. Golub. Mr. Golub, we have thousands of homeless people who call our office, and we try to help them get housing or solve some of the problems that they have in, in, in the shelters. The mayor instituted a new policy for the homeless in October, and I wondered if you could tell me what you think about that policy. Um, I don't know that policy. I don't know what that policy is. Um, I'm sure once I'm in the office, I'll be able to figure out what the policy is, evaluate it, and go well, over it. What we can do for homeless people is that we can start getting back all the resources that are being taken away from New York City. We give away $24 billion a year in overtaxes to the federal and state government. And in the end, what the public advocate should be doing is letting the people of this city actually know that we're giving away all this money. You go on the street and talk to people, nobody knows this is going on. And in the end, that's half of New York <coughs> City's budget. So, but, home but but how can you be public advocate? Let's get serious here mm -hmm. of this city, and you don't know what some of the homeless policies. I'm are. not in the office right now. That's why. When I get in the office, I'll know every policy. The truth is, if you want me to recite the city charter and ask Ms. Gottbaum which what 24B of the city charter actually says, she might not be able to say it. What does that prove? Nothing. When I'm in the office, I'll evaluate the policy like I've done with many other policies. When you go on my website, J for NYC, you can see all the very detailed plans that I have for the city of New York. Mr. Rache, who would you like to address your question? I would like to address my question to, to Betsy Gottbaum. Betsy, the public advocate's title means that you would be available to the public as often as possible. Recently, some New Yorkers asked you to release your public schedule. Mayor Bloomberg, Hillary Clinton, and other well-known public officials regularly release their public schedule so that the public actually knows where they are. So if they want to meet them, they can. Can you tell us why you didn't release your public schedule and whether or not you think it's a good idea for New Yorkers not to be able to have access to their public advocate? Yes, I can absolutely tell you why I did not re release the public schedule. When you had somebody call my office and ask where was the public advocate because the person you had called wanted to find out where I was. We don't give out the public schedule to just anybody that calls the office because we have been told by my security detail and by the police department to be very careful because I don't know if you know, Andrew, that I have had a stalker and this stalker actually came at me in March in the, in the Javits Center, and lo and behold, the other day, last week, when I was doing a press conference, he reappeared. Now, I'm really sorry. I do what my security detail tells me to do and what the New York City Police Commissioner tells me to do. The public advocate, in fairness now, though, you also have police I have a protection. Public, yes, and I have a public you schedule. You have an armed police officer with yes, you. Yes, I do. I do, and the police officer was there that day, um, and, and um, absolutely, and it was fine. But my point is, if I release, I, I put any public event that I have on, this, on the day book, and any reporter who ever asks us or anybody but that we know. But the reporters are not the public, Betsy. But any person, would you really want me to let somebody that you had call me but, say? But we were just acting like any New Yorker who has a right but to know who their like public advocate is. But you can't act like any New Yorker, especially when I've had a security problem. Well, you know, problem. if I'm public advocate, every New Yorker is going to have access to me regardless. Well, then I certainly hope you don't get any kind of a threat, uh, Andrew. Okay. That comes with the job, Betsy. Okay. Mr. Golub? Not if they really come uh, after you. My question for Mr. Siegel. Um, in a lot of the debates we've been at, you've made clear that you're against economic ideas like the West Side Stadium, the Brooklyn Arena, uh, big box stores. Um, what would you say to the carpenters, plumbers, construction workers, and the near 50 percent African male population in this city who's looking for a job today? I'll tell them what I've been telling them all along. Jobs are very important. I come from a working class family, trade unionist family. I know what jobs are important, how you need that money for rent, for food. But what I also tell the unions is we have to have responsible development. Well, what economic development projects would you support? Well, I think if you have projects like the Columbia Project or uh, the project on Brooklyn that you mentioned, uh, take eminent domain off the table, and then you can begin to have discussions with the community and find common ground. When I'm the public advocate, we'll be able to do responsible development where developers work with the community. I want it up front where there's a process where people can come involved. 
you should be against eminent domain, and I would imagine knowing your background, you're against eminent domain. And so a lot of the projects right now, the big ones here, use eminent domain. Would I think it, it's a you, fundamental Wouldn't your problem? proposed labor rights okay. board make cost of doing business uh, in New York City very high? No, because it'll be voluntary and it won't cost anybody anything. That's a something that unions need for the right to organize. Unions need the right for collective bargaining. I'll do it where it won't cost anyone anything. It'll be an advisory board. Okay, I have to move to the second round of questioning, and then we're going to do our lightning round of questions before we go back to the uh, standard, if you will, questions. We begin again with you, Mr. Norman Siegel. Who are you addressing your question to? Uh, Betsy Gottbaum. Uh, Ms. Gottbaum, during the Republican National Convention last summer, the Bloomberg administration and the NYPD illegally detained more than 1,800 people at Pier 57. Ninety percent of all those arrests have been either dismissed or adjourned in contemplation of dismissal. Along with other lawyers, <coughs> I went to court and won the release of the detainees. Why didn't your office defend the basic constitutional rights of both demonstrators and innocent bystanders alike? Well, Mr. Siegel, you are a very good civil rights lawyer, and that's where I think you should stay. And let me say that just what was going on at the piers was not all that was going on in the city during the Republican National Convention. I had worked with the Parks Commissioner and tried to get the park available for demonstrators. I also worked to fought the police department to get the equipment released that had belonged to the protesters, the bikes and the cameras. And I, s I went to the city healing here, city council hearing and questioned the police department as to why those people were detained and, and, and what were the reasons. And I also went to many protests. For the record, I was the one who negotiated with the DA to get all the bikes released. Okay. Ms. Gapam, you're up. Who would you like to address your question to? Uh, to Mr. Siegel. Um, Mr. Siegel, last week I met with the police commissioner and he told me that the searches in the subways, the random searches in the subways, are in fact a deterrent to terrorism. He also assured me that racial profiling is not occurring, that these are just random searches. He believes, and I agree with him, that New Yorkers feel safer. Why we, are you against this policy? Well, first of all, you don't understand what my policy is if you say I'm against it. What I have said from the very beginning, that it ain't enough. It's not good enough to make people feel good. What the government must do is protect people, make them secure. If you're giving up your Fourth Amendment right, you better get something back in return that's real. When the police department mentions that they're at 468 subway stops, the two subway stops that I use on 72nd Street and uh, Broadway and Central Park, they're not there. And lots of New Yorkers have said they're not there. I have advocated for uh, metal wands that they're now doing. I've advocated for stopping and searching everyone's bag and using technology as they do at the airport. So when you characterize my position, you're misstating it Well, publicly. Mr. Siegel, I have been down in the subways and I have seen the police uh, searching the bags and I have seen them create a, an atmosphere of great effect. People are very happy about it. Well, just because we're happy doesn't mean we're safe and secure. That's the goal. Well, I, I agree with Commissioner Kelly. Okay. Let's go now to Mr. Rache. Who would you like to address your question to? To Mrs. Gottbaum. Betsy, we recently learned that a group associated with the Church of Scientolo Scientology received over $600,000 of city money. And that Councilwoman Margarita Lopez received over $100,000 donation, uh, donations from people associated with that group. I have a plan to open the budget process so that whenever any organization makes a, a request of city money, we find out about it before the budget's approved, not after. Where were you when this particular allocation was made that has cost the city of New York $600,000 when we should have had an opportunity to look at it before it was approved? Well, first of all, Andrew, I don't think you know what the role of the public advocate is. I do not have budget oversight over the city budget or the city council budget so that I cannot look at each council member's allocation and have a determination of what is happening. But you could happening. have offered a plan for well, more, a more open process. But let me just say what the, what the job of the public advocate is. I preside over the city council. I can go to all committee hearings. I can go to meetings. But, but I have no oversight over the budget process. But you can propose legislation. But I, the, 
And the that legislation could ask that for people. That particular occurrence happened after the budget was passed. And what w there was no, there's no way in but which we can do anything about it. But this kind of pork barrel politics is going on in New York all the time. And you're our public advocate. What are you doing to keep this? But the public advocate doesn't have oversight over the budget of the city council. But I'm not asking to have just oversight over the budget. What I'm asking you to do is to have uh, offer legislation to open the process to the light of day so the public can see what happens before the budget is approved. Well, I think that that is something that it, it's not in the purview of the public advocate's office. Protecting and if it the money of New York is not in the purview that's of the, the public advocate. That's what the controller The public advocate is okay. supposed to look okay. out for all of our okay. interests. Okay, I have to step in. Now it's uh, time for your question. Ms. Kappa. Go right ahead. Um, I have a plan to bring a school choice program to New York City schools to try to help the mm -hmm. poorest kids in our worst schools. This 100,000 person plan would give really the communities the right to be able to start running their own schools, especially in the worst areas of New York City. What initiatives, what legislation have you proposed, what press releases have you re actually released in relation to these ideas, and, and what would you do, and what would you say to those kids that are failing today in New York City's public schools? Well, I've been consistently involved since in the last four years with what's going on in the Department of Education, and I was in favor of the mayor getting control over the Department of Education, and I have been out there looking at the reforms and saying what are the reforms that need to be reformed. I have talked about special education. I have talked about the lack of, of a good suspension policy. I have talked about overcrowding and how the smaller schools are creating w big overcrowding in, in the high schools. I have been consistently involved with the pr issues of education and frankly one of the things I have been talking about is why the mayor hasn't uh, negotiated a contract with the teachers well, union see, that's because what you always that seem to talk about is an important thing to do. That's, that's what you always seem to talk about though is the teachers union seems to be your main focus. Not like I have anything against the teachers union to be honest the with you. The truth is, is not my that there's focus. other options. There's other the options. Union, the well every idea okay. that you tend to support let, tends to let, be let one place where I'd like to see some flexibility in that. Seconds for response okay. before we move on. Go ahead. First of all, I believe that teachers in this city are the ones who do the hardest work. They're out there every day and they do a fabulous job. This isn't about the and teachers. Okay, and, okay, and what I'm schools. saying is, in order to keep them, in order to keep them in the schools and to keep them from going to the suburbs, we need to get the teachers a contract and get them a raise. I have been consistent on that. It has nothing to do with the UFT. It has to do with how I have seen teachers throughout this city, throughout the five boroughs, what they have done. Okay, I have to step in. Mm -hmm. Now it's time for our lightning round where we will ask all of you a question that can be only be answered with a yes <laughs> or a no. And if you watch the uh, debate for mayor, then you know that I will enforce the rules if necessary here. Here is the first question. If you were acting mayor, regardless of the law, would you perform gay marriages? Mr. Siegel. Yes. Yes. Public advocate, Mr. Rache? Yes. Mr. Gallup? No. No. Would you consider consider voting for Michael Bloomberg this November? No. That's a gap on? No. Mr. Rache? No. Mr. Gallup? Yes. You would? I would consider it. Mr. Siegel? No. Next question. Was David Dinkins a better mayor than Rudy Giuliani? Mr. Rache? Yes. Mr. Gallup? You said was David Dinkins a better a mayor? A better mayor than Rudy Giuliani? No. Mr. Siegel? Yes. Public Advocate Gottbaum? Yes. If the mayor unexpectedly leaves office, as you know, the public advocate would fill in for 60 days, would you be interested in running in the special election <coughs> to succeed that mayor? Mr. Gallup? I will. It's hard to consider that. I would say yes no. Yes or no? I would say no. Mr. Siegel? No. Mrs. Gopon? Yes. You would be interested in running to become After the mayor permanently? Days. Yes. Mr. Rache? No. Next question. Could you do a better job than Mayor Bloomberg? Mr. Siegel? Yes. Ms. Gopon? Yes. Mr. Rache? Yes. Mr. Gallo. Yes. <laughs> All four of you believe we you could agree. do a, Make a the job tougher, please. You think you can do a job better than the current mayor. Do you support the existing plans to build new ballparks for the Mets and the Yankees? Ms. Gapon? Yes. Mr. Rache? No. Mr. Uh, Gallo? Yes. Mr. Siegel? No. 
do you think the city should push for the Olympics in 2016? Mr. Rache? Yes. Mr. Gollum? Yes. Mr. Siegel? Yes. And Ms. Scapa? Yes. Are you in favor of putting tolls on East River bridges? Mr. Gollum? No. Mr. Siegel? No. Ms. Scapa? No. Mr. Rache? No. Do you support the smoking ban enacted by Mayor Bloomberg? Mr. Siegel? Yes. Ms. Gottbaum? Yes. Mr. Rache? Yes. Mrs. Mr. Gottlieb? Yes. Do you think the police officers who shot Amadou Diallo were over-indicted? Ms. Gottbaum? No. Mr. Rache? No. Mr. Siegel? No. And it was a crime. Mr. Gallo. No. Finally, and I think we already know your answer to this upcoming question, public advocate. Did Mark Green do a better job as public advocate than Betsy Gottbaum? Mr. Rache? Yes. Mr. Gallo? Yes. Mr. Siegel? Definitely yes. No. <laughs> Ms. Gottbaum, no. Okay. Now, in the remaining time that we have, we're going to try and get as many questions as possible. And it's the same rules, rules that, that we announced earlier. We will begin with Mr. Siegel here. The rap on you, and I think you already know this, Mr. Siegel, is that you're good at being negative and complaining. But do you play well with others? Many New Yorkers know you as a public interest lawyer who's definitely not afraid to take on the establishment. But what instances, what examples can you cite where you have worked well with people who disagree, who you disagree with or typically fought with? Go to the 79th Street Boat Basin for the last two years. I've been negotiating for them so that they can stay there with the Parks Department uh, over a two-year period. I think we're going to get what we wanted with consumer affairs, with people in nightclubs. Same thing happened. Uh, I know how to build coalitions, the Staten Island Coalition Against Bigotry. For two years, I've been out there working with people. I listen. I build bridges around racial lines. I taught at New York High School. Today is the 16th anniversary, year anniversary, of the death of Yusuf Hawkins. I went back to my high school in Bensonhurst with Galen Kirkland, and for 12 years, every Friday morning, we taught two classes, one at risk, on civil rights and race. I do a lot more than just be in a courtroom. And when people think that I'm just the litigator, they don't understand me and stereotype me, and that's wrong. And people will see when I'm the public advocate, I have a lot of different skills that will bring people together in a positive, constructive way. Thank you very much. Ms. Gottbaum, does Mr. Siegel play well with others? Well, I'm not going to say whether he plays well with others. I think Norman is running for public adversary as opposed to public advocate. But I have to say, as public so what was that again, public advocate. She used public it four years adversary ago. Same instead line. of public it didn't advocate. Work then it doesn't well, work I won. now. Well, it um, doesn't work in but the sense I believe, of being truthful. I believe that when you're public advocate, you should try to work to get in, you know, to have compliance with people, to work, to build coalitions. But I do believe, and I have done this, take on the mayor when the priorities that he has are not the ones that I believe are right for the city of New York. Number one was the stadium. From day one, I fought against that stadium. There are other areas where I have fought the mayor. Meals on wheels, homebound seniors not getting their meals on wheels on a daily basis. That's just wrong, and I have fought him, and it hasn't spread to other parts of the city. So I think you have to be conciliatory and you have to work with people like the commissioners but I think you also have to be prepared to take people on Mr. Rache. Well I have a lot of respect for Norman Siegel's history as a civil liberties lawyer. Thank you. But I believe that leadership today is better than litigation tomorrow and frankly Norman even though you've been saying you want to deputize public advocates all throughout New York we already have tens of thousands of public advocates who are working to make our city better. They're volunteering in schools, they're feeding the homeless, they're joining nonprofit boards and community boards, and they're working hard to make their neighborhoods stronger and better. I have real ideas and a real plan to grow our economy, to give our kids a 21st, edu 21st century education so they can get the jobs they need in the future, modernize our city services, and help our citizens have a true and real voice in our city government. The difference is 
between us is that you represent the politics of the past. I'm thinking about new ideas to bring our city forward into the 21st century. Thank you. Mr. Golub? Norm plays well with others. We've had fun in all these debates, and I think we've challenged each other. And uh, I think it's been stimulating, interesting, and uh, I think Norm would be an excellent public servant, just not for this job. The truth is this job needs somebody who understands more than just this one issue. He needs to be well-rounded or she needs to be well-rounded in all areas, in education, in taxes, in economic development, in crime, terrorism prevention. And unfortunately, I think Norm spends a lot of time, very accurately, working on one issue. And I think we need somebody a lot more well-rounded than that. Response from Mr. Siegel. I work on lots of different issues. You talk about civil rights, consumer issues. You talk about race relations. I think what this office really needs is someone who's fiercely independent, who can be the outsider, who can work with the insiders. And when the insiders are unreasonable and they're not following what the law requires, when people are putting up uh, posters all over the city when the law says no, you need someone who's prepared to blow the whistle on everyone, including even if you're friendly with people. Because the rule of law is important, and when citizens see that the people in power are not following the rules, it's all about hypocrisy. I'll be very good at blowing the whistle and working with people who want to be reasonable. Thank you, Mr. Siegel. Ms. Gottbaum, and the next question is for you. After, and it's a two-part question, if you will, after an initial meeting with m the mayor, Controller Thompson, and you, the mayor doesn't meet with you, and he almost never confers with you, although you were personal friends before 2001. So what went wrong with the relationship with Mike Bloomberg? Do you think he's a mayor who listens to others, or is he more like a my way or the highway Giuliani, though with a softer tone? And, and part two to that is, is it something that you would do different in term two since you took office in uh, 2002? Well, you'd have to ask Mike Bloomberg why he cut the budget the first month that I was public advocate, 45 percent. And you'd have to ask him why he um, has not met with me since we had a rather large argument over the Meals on Wheels program in, in his office. I do have access to his commissioners and access to his deputy mayors. And I feel that the administration, the commissioners, ha are excellent. And they do an excellent job. So that's the, the level at which I get my work done. And I do believe that we do things better when we work together. But I will try the next term very hard. Is he a mayor that listens? Well, he doesn't like to be criticized, but then a lot of people don't. Uh, but, but I will try very hard the next term to understand those areas. I know those areas where if we work together, we can get things better done, done better for New Yorkers. And when I have to, I will fight him, like on the stadium. I was consistent from day one. I fought that stadium on the west side. I never deviated. I never backed down. And I think that showed that I certainly am in contact, and excuse me, in contrast to the mayor when I have to be. Thank you very much, Mr. Rache. Well, Betsy, if I remember correctly, you admitted that you voted for Mike Bloomberg in the last election. And this time around, you're saying you're not going to vote for him. I guess it's because he didn't listen to you during the last four years. But frankly, the public advocate should have a completely independent relationship from the mayor, as well as from the city council, and really advocate for the public. And you don't actually need a big soapbox or a loud voice to be an advocate for the citizens of New York. You need, how to, you need to know how to organize all the public advocates in New York to make sure that the city actually has uh, their interests in mind. And so while Mayor Bloomberg was busy running his mayoralty, you were busy releasing press releases about lifeguard pay or turnstiles not working properly in the MTA. In fact, recently we discovered that the MTA had a $600 million um, Homeland Security budget that they didn't use. And we didn't hear anything from your office about that money. And we could have used it, like we just found out today, the MTA is finally allowing cell phones to be used in the subway so that when you see something, you can actually say something. And, and let me ask you a quick question here, Mr. Rache. I saw your press release earlier. Are you really taking credit for what the MTA is doing with the cell phones? I've been talking about getting cell phones working in subways for years. And you're taking credit for this? Well, frankly, I brought it up three weeks ago in the campaign, and finally the MTA is responding. So um, I am taking credit for it, yes. Okay. Mr. Golub? Well, Bloomberg cut her budget, and truthfully, she did nothing about it. 
Bloomberg decided to uh, take powers away from her, and she did nothing about it. Um, I think we want a public advocate that at least would fight for her own job before she'd fight for the people of the city. So what and should she have done? What would you have done in that situation? Raise the public awareness to the fact that this was being cut. It happened. And, Didn't and she do that? Didn't not Obviously not that? enough, because the truth is this job was put in the charter by the people of this city because they wanted somebody to be a watchdog for city government. That's why it was brought in in 1989. Um, you know, the truth is she was on a channel... Uh, another channel, I won't say which one, and was asked the question whether the mayor was listening. You know what the answer was? The answer was, I'm not sure. You know, and that really is not what the second person in city government should really make an answer for. And one last comment, the West Side Stadium, you were consistent on it. You know, the truth is, 6,000, 7,000 great jobs, an economic stimulus package that would have helped New York City. I'm not sure I would be so proud that we actually stopped that from happening. With Mr. regard to the budget cuts and what the public advocate should have done is move to change the city charter so that the budget is an objective standard like the Independent Budget Commission so that you don't have the executive or legislative branch, which is what the public advocate is supposed to be monitoring, have the control over your budget. Create a charter amendment so that it's .0025 of the $50 billion budget for the City of New York, and that helps independence. When you don't have a vision or you don't understand what advocacy is about, when you don't have a vision or understand what independence is about, then you let these issues go by. It was another missed opportunity, Jay's correct. You organize, you create a public awareness, and the public should be for the public advocate. The public should be for the people's lawyer, the people's advocate. And when the executive branch cuts your budget, it's like Clint Eastwood, you made my day, because then you bring the issue to the forefront. And finally, the public advocate is not a vice president. You're not there as a team. There should be a healthy tension between the public advocate's office and uh, the uh, executive branch. And finally, okay. I didn't vote for Michael Bloomberg. I voted for Mark Green last time. Ms. Ms. Well, Ms. there you go again, Norman. Clearly, you don't know what the ch how the charter works in the city of New York. You can't introduce a charter change unless the mayor introduces the charter or allows you to introduce the charter change. It doesn't work that way. Now, what did I do? I fought the mayor. I went to the city council. I got part of the budget restored. I am now back up because I have gotten the budget restored by the city council. But let me be very clear. I am trying very hard. I've gone to the Charter Commission. I have made a presentation to them to say that I want an independent budget for this office that is a, a percentage of another budget just the way the independent budget office because I believe that this office should be independent. You shouldn't have to be dependent upon the mayor nor should you be dependent on the city council. I am trying very hard to do that. But okay. once the mayor says you can't do it, you can't put it on the charter. Thank you, Ms. Kapam. And now it is time for the one minute closing statements from the candidates. And we begin with Mr. Siegel. I want to be your next public advocate. <coughs> New Yorkers need to know where the public advocate stands on vital questions. Eminent domain. Unlike the current public advocate, I will not flip-flop on this issue. I will be consistent. I will protect every New Yorker's home and business so that when New York City tries to condemn your property and give it to a big developer, I'll be there fighting for you. On the right to protest, under my watch, this city will never, never again deny people the right to peacefully march against George Bush's war as the city did on February 15, 2003. I'll also stand tall for labor unions so that they can hold picket lines. And when the recruiters from the military come to our schools, I will tell parents and students they don't have to give out the information that the military wants. And furthermore, I'll get DOE to make sure that notices are in many languages. We can work together. We don't have to accept the status quo. We can work together and dare to dream about how it should be, not how it is. And together, we can make these dreams a reality for all. Vote for me on September 13th. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Siegel. And now, Ms. Gottbaum. Well, I love being New York City's public advocate helping individuals and families and making life in the city better for them. And I have a proven track record over the past four years that I'm very proud of. 
That's because I understand what the Public Advocate's Office is all about. I've helped thousands of people, children, seniors with government problems, and there is more work to do. And I do want to expand the Ombudswoman's Office, and I do want to have oversight with over 311. And I have a vision for my second term. I want to make schools better for kids, and I want to make sure that people do not live in dilapidated housing. And I will fight, as I have done. But let me make it very clear. The public advocate succeeds the mayor if, God forbid, anything would happen to him or her. And I believe that my distinguished records, which some people are trying to denigrate at this table, my distinguished record over 30 years in government, outside of government, running not-for-profits, and finally, as the public advocate for four years, makes me uniquely qualified to be public advocate and to assume the post if it happens to happen. Thank you very much, Ms. Kapam, and now Mr. Rache. Public advocacy is in my blood. I learned this eight years ago when my father took me back to his hometown in Poland where he was born. And we were traveling through the town, we passed the town community center, and my father told me that he laid the bricks for that building when he was 10 years old. It turns out that my grandfather was like the mayor of this town, and he was concerned that there was no public place for any of the people in the town to meet. So he and my grandmother raised the money to buy the materials, and on weekends, he and his three sons built that community center brick by brick. My grandfather was killed during World War II with 15,000 other Polish officers on one day with his t hands tied behind his back. But he'd be proud to know that his grandson is still building communities in a city called New York brick by brick. That's my vision of the Public Advocate's Office. I want to connect all the public advocates and make their voices heard and amplified so that we can have a true, vibrant public advocate's office. And that's what separates me from my opponents. You know, I don't believe that one politician can solve the problems of eight million people. I do believe that eight million people working together can solve the problems of our city. So on September 13th, vote for Andrew Roche and help me connect New York. Thank you, Mr. Roche, and now Mr. Gallup. Uh, it's time for new ideas. It's time for a change. Uh, right now, we're going in the exact same old direction with the old methods leading to the same old problems. It's time we have a new vision about taxes, cutting taxes, reducing the size of government, using an oversight board that I've proposed, uh, education reform, like expanding charter schools to 200 rather than 100 uh, that are ex existing in New York State, um, vouchers to give communities a chance to run their own schools. Homeland Security, uh, my plan to uh, create a reserve force for, of policemen so that in case of an emergency we can call up people that will be all around the city to help us in case of emergency. I'm talking about these ideas not because I'm running for any office but public advocate. And what I want to do is rally all of you to new ideas and new thinking. If you don't like my ideas, you tell me, Jay, I don't like your ideas. That's fine. In the end, we need new ideas. We need to stimulate those ideas. The public advocate has a very powerful role, one that uh, Ms. Gottbaum really understates completely. And in the end, if we don't go in a new direction, we don't go for change, we are headed in the same direction. And uh, honestly, New York City can't afford that right now. I thank you very much, and I thank the four of you for joining us tonight. On behalf of New York One and New York One No TCS, again, we want to thank the candidates for taking part in tonight's debate. That was sanctioned by the city's Campaign Finance Board.